Where's the first? The true story of Z100 New York available today, Thursday, for pre-order, available tomorrow uh, on Apple TV and available everywhere you download, rent, or purchase your content. I mean, it is literally everywhere. How's it going today, Mitchell? Good, 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 good. And we're like in the midst of all this press, which has been just so um, surprising and welcoming. So it's 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 um, it's been great. It's been great. And you know, the, we have other things going on, and to be able to focus on this is is you know most of the time has been amazing. So we were recording music for another show that we're doing that actually Scott is the guest on. You know, Scott Shannon's the guest on to promote that I do. So um, it's so I was recording a theme for it last night till about two thirty in the morning, and then woke up for press this morning on Sirius. So it's just like it's interesting. It's a whirlwind this week. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. Oh, awesome. Now, uh, speaking of you yourself being on Sirius, I'd be curious when was the first time that you heard yourself on the radio? <laughs> okay, first of all, thank you. I deserve that question. Having interviewed, having interviewed probably 250 musicians um, across the course of my career for docs or what have you, I cannot count. I probably asked that question 251 times. So it's only fair you ask. Um, as a musician, um, as a musician in a band on Fordham's radio station, that was like the place to be because it was like the cool kid radio station and we were doing um, African music. So it was to be on that station, that was like my version of Z100, you know, as a, as a punk musician, you know, doing something that a little bit out there. So, yeah, and um, <laughs> thank you for asking that question. Someone somewhere is like now saying, gotcha, deserve it, full circle. And it's, it's it, you know what? Radio, I, I've been asked a lot about radio and of course I'm not a part of iHeart, Z100 or any of that. I'm just, radio is there. It's radio something that it's just like all technology, right? Yeah. You know, the, the, the stations have evolved. So something, you know, radio is this, you know, now radio is this, radio is my phone. Radio is, you know, not just when, when you're in the car or what have you. People podcasting is another, what we're doing today is another version of radio podcasting. So it's just a matter of audio communication. And that's how I studied it as, as um, as someone who thinks about media and community and storytelling, it's like audio is at its almost is at a new peak now with with the podcasting. So your def depending on your definition of radio, it's never been bigger. How do you consume radio today? Like with the evolution of it. So if I'm in my car, we're we're blasting. You know, we're blasting. Um, I love Little Steven's show because he he teaches you stuff about music that you've never heard in the underground garage. I listen to um, reggae. I listen to, sometimes I go to Hall of Fame rock and, and what have you. So our, our music tastes are pretty wide. Um, so on an app, on my phone, Bluetooth in my car, as, as most people do. Okay. Now, I'd also love to ask, what, what music did you listen to when you were younger? And what are you listening to today? I was a hardcore, uh, I guess what would be called classic rock, um, Delta blues. And, and then when the punk movement came, that was what just spoke to me. It met me where I was. So the clash, I mean, people don't remember that the police, the police started as a punk band. All the bands that were coming out of England were like amazing. The, the police were, we saw them live, my wife and I, we've been together literally since teenage time. And we saw the police live when they first came and they were hard, they, were, they, they hit as hard as anyone. Um, they hit as hard as the clash in their own way. It was just, and it was just three of them. So people don't remember that about them. They think about like the do, 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 the da, 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 but that wasn't how they started, you know? Okay. Um, so punk, um, and then I, then, I, then I just fell into uh, the music of Africa and discovered that like most things, almost everything came from there. So from vocal chanting to percussion to what have you, I ended up doing a lot of that myself and got to play with a lot of the, 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 the well-known musicians from there. And that was like my moment, like, you know, for a guy from Brooklyn to be able to do that, it was pretty cool. Okay. Any big names that you rock with that you really remember from that? Um, 
I hate dropping it. Let's just say sure. everyone. Let's just say how about this? Everyone that played on Graceland except for Paul Simon. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> How's that? Sure, that's totally fair. And a lot of um, you know, it was great because a lot of musicians that were famous in in different parts of Africa came and um, emigrated to New York. So uh, you know, we had a very popular band that a lot of them would come and listen to and then we get to play so i got to play with everybody and play on a bill with ladies with black moon basel which was just otherworldly you know to be able to do that and it was just a constant pinch me moment so actually and you awesome. know what's more important than music whatever the type of music what's more important than music um as i've said in several interviews if you go to autocratic countries what's the first thing they usually cut they cut music why? Because it's emotional, because it's meaningful, because you don't need news, you don't need the lyrics to be in your own native language to understand the message of the singer. So to me, sure. you know, anytime, anytime we've had a chance to do anything with music, my answer is always going to be yes. Um, we never chase the budget. It's just about like, how can we help do this? And how can we get music and, you know, tell another music story because it might inspire someone not just to play, but to me, to listen to music and, and, you know, just understand it for what it is. That's awesome. Now, obviously you have such a passion for music with how you talk about it, the guitars in your background. <laughs> so I'd love to ask, like, can you talk about writing this kind of love letter to New York radio and to Z100? Yeah. You know, you start out as a documentarian. Um, I've done two types of films, right? I've done ones that are not hard hitting docs. They're, they're, they're big stories, right? Like, sure. like Road to MSG, I did a series Road to MSG, and we did 10 episodes with some of the biggest musicians there were. And, you know, that's a big story, right? But you find the individual small story there. So with those types of docs, the, I guess the artist to me, for lack of any, or the, the inquisitive person to me is, I always reduce it to an, to a one-on-one -on -one level. And I, and I talked about them, about their love of music, taking them back to what made the artist the artist, you know, because people just think people just wake up one day and here's their hit song. You know, it's a lifetime to get there. And then it's another lifetime to keep it going. And the, the other types of docs I've done are ones that you won't see in stream. You know, they end up, um, and a film festivals, they're, they're political. They're always David versus Goliath or Davida versus Goliath stories. I love against all odds stories. It reflects my background. You know, my family grew up in Brooklyn was not much of anything. And, you know, my wife, when we, when we first met, she was 19, I was 20. I think we had maybe $50 between us, you know, and we love showing our daughter, our bank account. And when we got married with $300 in it, it's like, you know, but you could do anything. You know, especially now, there's so many platforms for storytelling. You know, there's so many platforms for art, you know, and you just don't give up. Because uh, interestingly enough, Don McLeod, who's an icon in radio and, and, and marketing, he brought me into Z100 and he said to me once, my business was just getting started and no one knew if we were doing anything. And it took forever to even, you know, go a little bit in the black, right? Um, and he said to me, you ever think about the fact that the people who give up, if they just didn't give up, they, if they waited five more minutes, maybe the phone would have rang. You know, and, and two years later, after Don told me that the phone rang and he was inviting me to go to, um, to work with then Z100, which was back in the shallow lands. You know, they were, they okay. were, they had fallen off. They had fallen off and they were at the bottom. And he asked me and, and, and everyone said, why are you going to go do that? It's terrestrial radio. I said, well, you know, I get to go backstage at the garden. So who's not going to do that, right? And you know, I think we lost $1,000 on that job, by the way. And it was after 9-11, so we could have used the money. But who doesn't go backstage at the garden if you're, I mean, it's anyone could buy a ticket. But to go backstage, you have to be invited, you know? And, and so we did that. And, you know, one thing led to another. And, um, you know, the punk in me was like, well, I'm going to go and see this pop show and who really cares about these people? And when I met the people who are running Z100, and this is the beginning of the love letter, it's like, I found people that were just as passionate about music 
as I was. You know, it worked for a company, but they all were in love with music and they were all in their college radio stations and they all had thousands of stops that they made before they got to Z100. Um, Tom Pullman, Sharon Daster, Paul Moraldi, these, these are Elvis Duran. Um, these were people who just were in love with music and were all on the radio behind the mics at one point, right? And just wanted to get out there. And, you know, as much as I didn't want to take it seriously, frankly, because I didn't know any better, you know, when you walk into Madison Square Garden um, and you hear 19,000 screaming kids, screaming for their artists, because it is true, every hero, you know, every generation puts a hero up the pop, uh, pop charts, right? When you hear them, you realize that's as meaningful to those people as the clash would be to me, you know? Okay. Or, or Robert Johnson, right? That's those people, you know? And they care just about much about their music as you or I. So it gave me a new prism to look at it. And, and you know, without my, without my nihilistic um, punk rock, you know, attitude. And so I realized they loved music. They were having hard times. Um, they probably, couldn't afford anyone else but us you know, <laughs> to try to help them to get out of their trouble. And um, I remember um, Darren Pfeffer, Paul Moraldi, two, two great people, Darren being you know, like a brother to me now as, as well as Tom, um, you know, over love of music, they said, well, do you do commercials? And I said, well, we used to before 9-11 <laughs> when there was a thing to do. And they said, well, what would you do for us? And I said, meet me in Times Square which is the center of the universe, right? And I said, Let, we're gonna start shooting these videos. And I just explained to him what I wanted to do. We're gonna bring the top artists in the world to Times Square and we're gonna have them, you know, we're gonna get that street cred back for music. And, you know, two years later, I was a little part of Z100 going back from worst to first in, in my era. So yeah. when I got the call, it was really funny when I got the call to, be considered to do this doc. I had no idea that Scott Shannon had anything to do with Z100. You know, from, from my limited knowledge, um, I thought he was like the PLJ guy, which was the, which, cause they had so much commercials on the air. You know, I used to switch off whenever I would see him. It's like another one of these, who cares? Um, <laughs> it wasn't music I cared about, right? Um, sure. Cause I hadn't had that like cleansing of understanding it was important to, to people that were 16, 17, and what have you. Um, and um, I met him. We started talking about it. And as soon as I met him, was like, well, I'm not going to let anyone else do this stop. And, and my only rule was, you know, I've done a lot of docs. You know, I, I've got my awards, you know, so I'm not going to do an infomercial. You know, I've done one infomercial in my life and said, I'm never doing that again because that's just a bunch of BS, right? So Scott, we're going to go where this takes us. And the funny thing about this fraternity and love letter and Z100, we invited so many of the uh, proponents, the opponents, excuse me, that Scott had during that era. Um, Don Imus couldn't interview him. He's not here, you know. And we didn't. I didn't want to put him. In, I didn't want to put him in the dock because he wasn't there to defend himself, you know. Um, but Jim Kerr, who was a was 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 one of the main opponents. He was he was with um, he was at PLJ and he was like the twenty two year old heartthrob and everyone loved him and what have you, and 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 he agreed to go in the film. Okay. So he comes in to, to do the interview, he ended up spending an hour and a half. I couldn't, I'd ask him the questions. I wasn't trying to maneuver him. You know, the truth is the truth. And even he was singing the praises of Scott because it was like, this guy came, hit the flamethrower and ran us over with a truck. We fought back, but whatever we hit him with, he hit him with us 10 times as much force. So it was, it was kind of interesting to try to show both sides and you know, we did the we did a bunch of that because Scott was a shock jock and Scott went after people. And, you know, I was able to put that in the film. But, you know, people who have been through the radio wars, I guess when they get to the other side, they respect each other so much. 
So it okay. wasn't the heat of the battle. I'm sure if we went back to 1983 and asked Jim Kerr the same questions, he might have answered differently. But, you know, in hindsight, he had such respect for Scott and Scott does for Jim. So it's kind of interesting to see how that all was. But as a New Yorker and speaking to the Z100 fans who are now international because of, of iHeart app, it's like when you mention Z100, it, it's you're talking about the quintessential New York station. So there's a big love affair with the station. And um, there was no escaping that. So, you know, documentaries tell you, give you your direction. So with all that Scott has done, and with all that station has done, the most interesting, unique, one of a kind story anyone could ever tell is 74 days, worst to first. Awesome. You know, and that's why we took it there. We mentioned a little bit, you know, of, of what happened afterwards when the ratings plummeted after Scott left. And we, we hinted at what happened when Elvis Duran and Tom Pullman actually revisited Scott Shannon's playbook and brought it back to number one. So it's very interesting. It's all about mm -hmm. love, of love of radio, love of music, but also understanding that you know, New York takes no prisoners. You got to be real with them. And, and to Elvis's credit, he's as real as Scott is. I mean, if he's having a bad day, you got to know about it because he's wearing his heart on his sleeve. Sure. Has Scott seen the film? And what did he think of it? Yes, he, he has. has. Uh, he has. Um, he liked it. You know, we have one famous scene in there that uh, it deals with not so much with the content, uh, verbal content or visual content, but the the music um when he gives his rant you know with first the worst first rant which i presume you've seen the film yeah 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 so he, he gives his rant and it's it's you know i think it's his version of the 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 network film we're not going to do it hell and not going to take it anymore right and okay. he's thinking we're going to score it this way or the out way and i said mm, we're just going to do it with drums <laughs> And, and, and to this day, it's like, you know, I go, we did it with drums. <laughs> so, so that was the, um, that was pretty much it. Um, he, you know, um, I heard from him, you know, he likes it, you know, he's pleasantly relieved, I guess, to a certain extent. Um, I'm sure there's some things he doesn't like besides the drums, but, you okay. know, he's, he's, he's been really cool about it. Did you have any like favorite interviews from the film that you kind of like maybe that you had to leave on the cutting room floor as this only is um, 60 minutes? Wow. We could, we could have talked, we could have talked about why it's 60 minutes. Um, Cause the first cut was three hours, by the way. Um, <laughs> wow. So there are moments. Yeah. There's moments in Scott's beginning of his career. There's, there's a moment, there's a moment that I wanted to put in the film and I, I realized it was about the Challenger incident and, and I did an interview with Scott about the Challenger when, 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 when the horrific accident happened. And what Scott did in that time is he went on the air and there was a controversy about how long it took and how long the astronauts lived, which was atrocious that people would even argue about that. And Scott made the point of going to dead air for the amount of time it took from the accident to when unfortunately the astronauts lost their lives. And I wanted to put that in there. And, and then I realized that for the tone of the film, it was, it was almost like, it's kind of like the director's moment, you know, like you're putting it in, why are you putting it in? You know, does it really fit in the story you're telling? Or is it really about you want to, have your fingerprints on it. And I, I didn't want to do that for that reason. Um, okay. But that, that was about it. There were so many interviews. I mean, my God, um, we have a whole other story. If, if, you know, every, if people like this, we have another two hours of interview for the modern worst of first story with crazy stuff. But it really was important to focus on those 74 days. It could be like the Z100 sequel. It could be a sequel. Uh, someone, uh, someone has, more than one person has said that, like, could you tell us more? Tell us the, the, that period. It was like, let's just see how this one goes. Please, God. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, I think, I think I do have time for one more. So just, I'd love sure. to ask, like, what is your hype up song in the morning? Like, do you have like a theme song almost? Yeah, there's at the moment for a, I mean, this is crazy. 
because when I was a baby musician, I would make fun of this song because of the music video. And I'm writing something now that, that we're a screenplay that I'm literally finishing this weekend. And it's about this female badass woman who I, I wanted to do in 2001, but no one accepted that women. I mean, the world we lived in then was no one would accept that character so I couldn't get arrested. Sure. And I wrote it finally during COVID with my partner, Paul Heyman. And the song to pump me up at the moment, right? Is The Warrior by Scandal with Patti Smythe. And don't look at the video, just put it on 10, you know, put it on 11, right? And you'll go, that's right, Patty, you're talking to me, sister. Um, and then, you know, we, we just recently saw David Byrne so, um, and his Broadway show. So, you know, Native Melody, you know, this must be the place. And, and that's like, you know, kind of like I pick up my dog, go run over my wife and harass her. But, but the pump up song at the moment of all things, I will admit is Patty Smythe. If you had asked me that prior to two weeks before, I would have had a whole other song. It was London Calling. But for now, The Clash has been moved to the side by Patty Smythe. So there you go. Awesome. You could have, make fun of me, but it's the truth. I'm going to go through this interview, get all your music recommendations and go through the film again and just make a, a playlist or something Thank because you. it's a lot of good stuff. Go, go awesome. listen to Salif Kita. He's amazing. You don't, he's not speaking English, but he's going to speak to your heart. Ah, okay, great. That's the a album is Sorrow, S O R O. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's a great way to end uh, talking about, uh, sorry, Worst to First, the true story of the Z100 New York. Thank you for your time today, Mitchell. And if I may, of just course. so I don't get yelled at later, you know, it, so Z1, uh, Worst to First, the true story of Z100 New York, available today, Thursday for pre-order, available tomorrow uh, on Apple TV and available everywhere you download, rent, or purchase your content. I mean, it is literally everywhere. And everywhere. it's available in Canada as well. Oh, good. Thank you for the Canadian shout out. And if anyone, anyone's noticing in Mozambique, you know, if anyone gets this in Mozambique, you could get it too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I thank you to, for chatting with me on the Film Career Theater Show. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye. Awesome.